सहनावतु सहनो भुनक्तु सहवीर्यं करवावहै तेजस्विनावधीतमस्तु मा विद्विशावहै ओम शान्ते 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 ही ओम पूर्णमद पूर्णमिदम पूर्णात् पूर्णमुदच्छते पूर्णस्य पूर्णमादाय पूर्णमेव वशिष्यते ओम शान्ते 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 ही श्रुते स्मृति पुराणानाम आलयं करुणालयं न मिभगवत् पाद शंकरं लोक शंकरं शंकरं शंकराचार्यं केशवं बादरायणं सूत्रभाष्य कृतौ वन्दे भगवन्तौ पुनः पुनः स्वरो गुरुरात्मेति मूर्ति भेद विभागिने व्योमवद्व्याप्तदेहाय दक्षिणामूर्तये नमः गुकारस्तवन्धकारस्च रुकारस्तन्निवर्तकः अंधकारनिरोधित्वाद् गुरुरित्यभिधीयते सदा शिवसमारंभां शंकराचार्य मध्यमां अस्मदाचार्य पर्यंतां वंदे गुरु परम परम अमानित्वमदं भित्वं अहिंसाक्षांतिराजवं आचार्य उपासनम् शौचम् स्थायिर्यमात्मविनिग्रह इंद्रियार्थेशुवैराग्यम् अनहंकार एवच जन्म मृत्यु जराव्याधि दुखदोषानुदर्शनम् असक्तिरन भिष्वंगह उत्तरदार ग्रहादिशु नित्यंच समचित्तत्वम् इष्टानिष्टो पपत्तिशु मैचानन्य योगेन भक्तिरव्य विचारिने विविक्तदेश सेवित्वम् अरतिर्जन सम्सदे अध्यात्मज्ञान नित्यत्वम् तत्वज्ञानार्थ दर्शनम् एतज्ञानमिति प्रोक्तम् अज्ञानम् यदतो न्यथा अमानित्वम् absence of manitvam, absence of pride that's the first value that Lord Krishna prescribes amanitvam as it is a value to be cultivated as a discipline to be followed in order to prepare the mind for the knowledge of the self because in order to know the self the mind should be tuned up with the self it should become like the self and amanitvam this absence of pride is in fact in absolute measure that is the nature of the self and therefore to the extent that we can cultivate that absence of pride, to the extent the mind is in harmony with the self, and to that extent it is ready to recognize the, the nature of its own self. <coughs> so, with that we discussed yesterday, amanitvam is 
This need, manitvam or the pride, arises from a need, need to be respected. Basically it comes from the need to feel good about oneself. And since I do not feel good about myself with reference to my own achievements, that I have some achievements. So manitvam or the pride, all this demand of respect comes because indeed a person does possess some qualifications. In terms of the learning, in terms of other accomplishments in life, that I do possess, maybe in terms of wealth, in terms of other power and recognition, I do possess certain qualifications, but then I want to be recognized by those qualifications. And then alone I feel satisfied when somebody recognizes those qualifications and respects me. Which means that I do not recognize those qualifications, or I do not respect myself for those qualifications. If I respected myself, then there would have been no need to demand respect from other people, then the, the occasion of being hurt when my demand is not fulfilled, that occasion would not arise. But the problem is that I am not able to respect myself. That is, I am not satisfied, I do not think that I am, I am good enough on account of whatever it is that I have accomplished in my life. <clears throat> the reasons are many of course because the world has, you know, there is certain convention as to what is meant by success and I keep on measuring myself, I guess, by the so-called accepted standards of success and I find myself inadequate as far as those standards, whatever it is. But the basic sense of inadequacy is there and therefore I am not satisfied even with my accomplishments. And therefore I want recognition for that. So we said that there is no need to seek recognition for that. There is no need to be proud about one's accomplishment that pride should be in fact diffused by what we call humility by recognizing that what I account, whatever accomplishments I have are all possible because of the privilege I am enjoying, because of the grace that I am enjoying, because of the gifts that are given to me. That is body, sense organs, mind, intellect, all of these are gifts and therefore whatever accomplishments I have at these levels are also gifts. I should be grateful, I should look upon myself as fortunate and should be grateful for the gifts that I have rather than proud. And so this pride can be diffused by what we call a sense of humility, not a false humility, but a sense of humility that arises from the recognition of realities of life. Vedanta always wants us to live in the real world and not just make believe that and uh, make believe now. In fact, if I understand the realities of life, humility will, humility will come. It is not recognizing that, that pride has come. And therefore, that's the reason why Lord Krishna calls all these values as jnanam or knowledge. Really, these values such as humility and others is not some kind of a behavior. It is not that because I behave in a certain way that I am called a humble person. It is really the perception that I have is what makes me a humble person. In meaning that humility also is a perception. And other values also we'll see are also perception rather than rather than a certain behavior. It is not that a given behavior is called humility. It is this perception, as I said, of the reality of life that brings about a humility. When I recognize that I am what I am due to the support and, and grace of many factors outside of myself, it's a privilege. I can and then I can enjoy that fact. I can enjoy my accomplishments provided my mind is free from pride and I can enjoy that. So that is how we be aware of the pride that we entertain which is false and by reminding your mind of the realities of life and where all these accomplishments come from, the mind will be able to appreciate, enjoy it in a spirit of humility and that's how we can deal with the pride. <coughs> Next is Adam Bhitvam. Understand that pride is a need in that. We should not condemn ourselves because I find myself a proud person. As I said, all of these pride and pretentiousness and whatever it is that we'll see, all of these are, have been cultivated by me because I so far thought them to be necessary. Because, so, I thought pride was necessary. To assert myself was necessary. To control others was necessary. This is what I found. To be angry was necessary. And I, I thought that if I would not be angry, then I'll be clobbered by other people and therefore it was necessary for me to put up a show of strength or whatever. And so in my process of bring, upbringing, growing, I being surrounded by the world as it is, surrounded by people who are stronger and more powerful than I am, 
and more successful and more accomplished than I am, it was necessary for me to have these things. And therefore, there's no reason why I should blame myself because I have pride or pretentiousness or there is anger, etc. That what Vedanta wants us to do is to understand where these things come from without father and mother and stuff like that, you know, basically ignorance. The source of all these, if you want to call them the evils or the damaging tendencies is ignorance and nobody else. Father and mother and anybody else only become instruments to create situations where these things were to happen. But primarily the problem is ignorance. And therefore we should develop this facility in ourselves to be able to trace each one of these to ignorance. That the pride comes because of ignorance of realities. And pretentiousness comes also because of ignorance. Ignorance of my own self. If I knew that I am a whole and complete being and that there is no need for recognition at all because a wholeness doesn't need any, any recognition. The ocean does not demand that it should be recognized and the river should come and recognize and pour the water into the ocean. Ocean doesn't demand. Ocean is quite comfortable with its own fullness and therefore there is no demand. And that I, I demand, that shows my need, that shows a lack of recognition of who I truly am. As I said, manam means equating myself with the body, equating myself with the personality, and whoever equates himself or herself with the personality will always feel small because however the personality is, it can never be infinite. As Swami says, even a world heavyweight champion can weigh, lift 600 kilograms of whatever. He cannot lift a mountain, you know. He can't lift. And therefore, Regardless of how I accomplish I am going to be limited. And therefore, if I want to see myself limitless at the level of my upadhi or personality, it can never be. <coughs> and therefore, this pursuit of becoming infinite or limitless at the level of my body and the mind, I want to have infinite knowledge, I want to have infinite strength, and I want to have infinite wealth, that's never going to happen. And unless I have all this infinite measure, I can never be satisfied if my satisfaction depends upon them. And so Vedanta says that, that says that, let our focus of satisfaction shift from this personality to the person, from this body-mind complex, let it shift to myself, let it look at myself. Maybe that, that totality or wholeness I am seeking is there. And Vedanta says that you are there. But I will look at myself provided I stop looking at the other things, seeking, seeking, you know, being infinite or limitless at this level of personality. And thus recognizing that a personality is personality. Either it's virtues and limitations. It is beautiful. Enjoy that. Enjoy a flower. Enjoy the body. Swami says, enjoy your body. Enjoy your mind. You need not go to watch any movies at all. You have all the movies in your own mind. Enjoy it. If I can enjoy flowers and trees and gardens and all kinds of things, how, can, how come I cannot enjoy my body? How can I, come I cannot enjoy the process that I am breathing and I am seeing and I am hearing? They are all beautiful things. There are much, in fact, much more sophisticated creation of flowers and fruits and trees, etc., you know. But then I always look out there for seeing beauty. I can, you know, I feel to see what is there with it, my own self. And so, I can enjoy myself without being infinite. That's all. I can enjoy my personality as given to me without its being infinite or without its being better than somebody else, without its being stronger than somebody else. I can enjoy it as it is. So this whole, you know, the, the whole attitude of the mind is what is what we call knowledge. All of this arises from knowledge. So understand that in the ultimate analysis, each of the values, particularly these, these kind of disciplines or values that were given, all of these ultimately amount to knowledge. That is why Lord Krishna calls them Jnanam. They are means of knowledge, but in fact they are knowledge themselves. And to that extent, that is why they become the means of ultimate knowledge. <coughs> and therefore, without having a complex that I am a bad person, because I am a proud person, without having that kind of a complex, without having to condemn myself, look down upon myself because there is pride or anger, I just accept them as realities as obtaining right now and then see what to do about them. <coughs> So Lord Krishna makes it very clear. Uddharet atmana atmanam natmanam avasadhaed. May one lift oneself up by oneself. May one lift oneself up by oneself. 
What do you mean by that? By Viveka Buddhi, that is by the understanding that is derived from Vedanta, let me lift myself. Let me lift my emotional personality from immaturity to maturity. Na Atmanam Avasadayet, and may I not lower myself. May I lower myself. So most of these Lord Krishna says, because sometimes this insistence upon the values also can create a complex that I cannot follow the values and I am such and such, that also is not right. It is not necessary to condemn myself to understand that whatever I am is also in order. In Swamiji's language, that that I am, whatever I am, that there is anger in me is in order, meaning there is a reason for it. That there is greed in me, there is a reason for it. There is fear in me, there is a reason for it. There is pride in me, there is a reason for it. So whatever is there in me, there is a reason for it. What is the reason? Ignorance is the reason. No other reason. Ignorance and the misconceptions brought about by ignorance or misperception of myself brought about by ignorance is the reason for all these what we call evil tendencies or demoniac tendencies or negative tendencies or hurting tendencies. The cause is ignorance. All of these are represented by the Kauravas. In the Pandava Kaurava battle, all of these are represented by Kauravas. And we said yesterday, these Kauravas are children of Dhritarashtra who was born blind. And that's the reason why Dhritarashtra's wife Gandhari, she was not born blind, but she was a Pativrata. Pativrata means one who always worshipped her husband. So for women, by the way, in, in this in this scripture, just for information, what is the path for mo what is the means of moksha for women, you know? Means of moksha is to worship husband, that's it. That will take them straight to moksha. For men, all kinds of things are required, you know, but for women, simple thing. Anyway, if you like that. So, <laughs> so Gandhari was one of those. And there are, there are examples of many women who actually followed this and achieved, you know, they are the, the most worshipful ones. Sometimes, you know, these women get pretty upset about uh, this Swamiji, why women are treated, how come, uh, uh, this girl asked me, how come God is always referred to as He, you know? How come Atma self is referred to as He? Why not she again? You know, things like that. I said, look, every morning when we pray, there is what we call Pratasmaranam. Pratasmaranam means the very uh, pious things of people that we remember in the morning. Punya Sloko, Nalo Raja, Punya Sloko, Yudhishthira, all these, these people with, with glorious, you know, uh, life we remember. Similarly, we also remember these women. These women who are well known as Pativrata, those who attained perfection on account of living a life of worshipping the Rasman means, you know, that was, uh, that was a priority. And so, Ahalya, Draupadi, Sita, Tara, Mandodari, Tatha, Panchakam, Nasmare, Nityam, Sarva, Papa, Vinasharam. If you just remember these five names, which are names of very pious women, it removes all your sins, so they say. And therefore, women in fact are placed at a very high pedestal as well. Anyway, that's not the point here. The, the point is that all these, uh, the whatever, what we call the negative tendencies, all of these arise from ignorance. And Vedanta does not trace a cause as father or mother or uncle or anybody else. We say that all of those things became just occasional. In order to create a situation which I had to go through, in fact, whatever it is that I went through is because it is what I had to go through. And so, not looking down upon oneself, at the same time not being complacent. And Swami, you say that I, you know, that it's all right that I have anger. <laughs> it's all right that I have. It's not all right that I continue to have. It's all right that I have now, but now that I understand that anger is the amazing thing, it is not all right to continue to have it. It's all right that I find myself having a limitation, but then a commitment also to become free from that. That commitment also is proper. <clears throat> and so as we understand these tendencies in our mind, as I said, first thing is to recognize them in our mind and understand the source of it, understand the mechanism of it and the method of dealing with it and then go about and dealing with them. This is the process. <clears throat> the Adam Bhitvam. Next one is Adam Bhitvam. Absence of hypocrisy or absence of pretentiousness. Man pretends 
pretends to appear different from what he or again I will miss he that includes she also you know why don't you say it's just she then it would include he also but somehow I don't know it has become a habit and so uh, you women also use the word he not only not only men use but then because that has been current you know and so no offense is meant to anybody when we use the word he it should be what we call in, in Sanskrit upalakshanam means a representative it represents all human beings <coughs> So pretentiousness, pretend to be different from what I am, this is also a habit. Two, this dambhi, dambha has two meanings, also svadharma prakati karanam, other meaning is always bragging about one's, the things that one has done, svadharma prakati karanam, that I follow certain religious practices or that I am a charitable person and so this kind of charitable or good acts that I perform and then announcing them, bragging about them, making the world know that I am so great. So that is also called Dambha. But Dambha is pretentiousness, pretending to be different from what one is. And this is also typically a problem with human being. No way there is pretension. Only human being wants to show himself as different from what he is. Nobody is in nature. The nature is all based on Radham Bhitva. There is no, no pretension. A camel, in India the camel is looked upon as an ugly animal, you know. India, I shouldn't say India, that's just some idea of what is called beauty, that's also a problem anyway. But therefore, whatever is the idea of beauty, the horse is a very beautiful animal, very graceful animal, you know. As compared to that, a donkey is not that graceful. And as compared to that, that I think a camel is even less graceful and therefore, and so, and it's so many uh, uh, twists are there in this body also and whatever it is, so that's why if I was like a camel with a hunchback here with something coming out, I would be very ashamed of myself. <laughs> I would perhaps go to a plastic surgeon and try to repair this thing, you know, so that I appear normal. Or I would try to hide those things. But camel has no shame at all, he doesn't hide. Nobody in the nature hides themselves. They just simply present themselves as they are. And therefore, as we said, these values are universal values. So, universe is what it is. It presents itself as it is. The nature presents itself as it is. A tiger presents itself as a tiger. And a dog presents itself as a dog. And a cat presents itself as a cat. And so, if a mouse is there, the cat will pounce upon that. Even if we are all sitting there, even if she is a royal cat, cat of the Queen of England, then also she will act as a cat. Not because I'm a royal cat, therefore I should not look, you know, do anything with the mouse. It is a cat. And therefore there is predictability. There is a predictability everywhere in nature because things act according to their nature. Except there is no predictability of human being. You just don't know what this fellow will do. As Swami would say, when this man comes home from the day's work, he knows how his dog will greet him. As he enters the house, the dog, he knows how the dog will greet him. We come and jump up and down and wag his tail, but he can never know how anybody else in the home will greet him. You know? <laughs> the same thing with woman, of course. How the spouse will greet him, you never know. How the children will greet him, maybe he comes home and everybody goes into their rooms, you know. Why? Because they have the freedom, you know, to be, to show whatever it is that they want to show themselves to be, whereas this dog and cat, they are always, they are predictable. So because there is no dhamma, there is no pretension, therefore everywhere in the nature, there is predictability. But a human being has this dhamma or pretension, there is also a need. A need to appear acceptable to the world. So whenever I find myself this limitation of defects within myself, oh, what I consider as defects. And how do I consider them as a defect? And so, Lord Shiva is praised like this. Lord Shiva has a big blemish, you know, on his neck. We should look upon as a mark of ugliness if it is there on anybody else's neck. Lord Shiva has a black mark here. You won't call it a black, big black mark here. If it is there, I think we will go to plastic surgeon and do something about it. But Lord Shiva doesn't do that. Says, this black mark, does it really look ugly on you? No, no, it looks beautiful on you. But the idea is that these are the kind of things that... So there is some definition of what they call beauty. And so, I guess the literature and everybody has defined what beauty is and what ugliness is.
So typically in Indian literature you find that what's a beautiful face? That like a moon, you know. So the face like moon is a beautiful face. And so face, some other kind of a face is not beautiful apparently. And that's why so many complexes are there within ourselves about our own self. Because we are very keenly aware of our own self and therefore we are very keenly aware of our own defects and limitations also. And I do not want to own up those limitations. I do not want to have own up those defects. In fact, I am ashamed of those defects. And therefore, I am entertaining a sense of shame about myself. So shame, shame, you know. This shame, shame business, you know, in, in, in Ahmedabad, you know, this last, the earthquake happened and the buildings were actually collapsing. So on the fourth floor, this mother was giving baths to her daughter, I think, you know. And then, all of a sudden, come on, come down, the building is collapsing, come down. And so the mother said to the girl, come on, let's get out of the bath. So shame, shame, I won't go out. She did not go out, really. And before they could remove that, you know, put some clothes and so forth, before that the thing collapsed. So, what I am saying is, such complexes are there as to what is shameful and therefore, everybody is suffering from complexes and of, you know, and therefore, whatever limitations I have, whatever, what I think are defects I have, this is, these are the things that I do not want to actually reveal or I do not want other people to know about it, I want to hide them because I am not comfortable with them. And therefore, this pretentiousness also, pretending to be different from what I am, this also arises from not accepting or owning up myself. Not owning up what I may call the limitations of myself. And I want to show myself as different from what I am. So here also, for a person, what we call a pretentious person also, he also wants acceptance by others. He also wants this to be respected by others. But that acceptance, the respect he wants by making a show of what he doesn't have. See, between this proud person and the pretentiousness, so there is a difference. Both of them are seeking attention. But a proud person is seeking attention based on what quality he possesses. And a pretending person, it is only by way of deceit. It is by way of fraud. It is by way of cheating or whatever that he is actually making a show of what he is not. And that's how he wants to gain acceptance by others. And so, that's why, as I say, people, everybody has that in one measure or the other. Because everybody knows that I am not complete. I am not perfect. And imperfections I always want to hide. Or imperfections I want to show them differently. And therefore I look at the mirror, find the hair is turning grey. Then I go to the beauty parlor, whatever it is, and then change the color of my hair to something else. I mean, nothing wrong in it. But this is an example of pretending to be different from what I am. I find that the wrinkles are appearing on my face. Again, do whatever I do, I don't know what they do, but anyway, to hide those wrinkles. <laughs> what they call skin care, you know, there's a big thing, skin care. So, all these complexes that we have, people are earning billions of dollars because of these complexes that we have. In fact, they create the complexes in us. See, the way to market, push the thing is, to first create a complex that you are not beautiful, and then, to tell me, look, give me a means of becoming beautiful. And that's how to sell their product. This, you know, this so called, I mean, what they call this Medicine Avenue people, they are very, very clever. And they are simply exploiting the, the psychological weaknesses of human beings and, and, and preying upon them. But anyway, and so uh, this is what people do. This is all part of what we call pretentiousness. Ask me, what is your age? It's a small people have pretend in a small way. They hide their age, they hide their salary and things like that. Sometimes people also create embarrassing situations. Like in India, traveling a bus or traveling a train, people, you know, they are all sitting together and they, they pick up a conversation, you know, what are you and who are you and where do you come from? In three, four minutes, they will ask you very, very intimate questions also. Where do you work? What's your salary? You know, and what is your bank account? All of these they ask you. Because that kind of boundaries are not there, people, you know, think there's, there's nothing wrong in there. He has no problem in telling what it is about him, but I have a problem. And therefore, I don't own up the fact that I am just making a low salary, and therefore, I will inflate my salary. 
I don't want to make an appearance that I'm an old person and therefore I'll deflate my age, you know. So as I said, up to the age of 60, I always say I am younger, 60 or 65, I play, I proclaim myself younger than what I am. After 65 or 70, I proclaim myself older than I am. I'm 75, I'm 80. And still I am, you know, in spite of being 80 or 85, still how healthy I am. But then the need, as I said, to be accepted. Why? So that I feel good about myself. Primarily, the need to feel good about myself. That's all it is. And that's what makes me pretend to be different from my, what I am. By Vesha, Bhusha, Chaturyam, by wearing clothes, you know. People have all kinds of decorations on their forehead. They have Tripunda and they have Tilaka and, and big. You have to go to Rishikesh to see some of these things. These Rudraksha Malas, huge beads are there and several of them there are there and, and Jata is there and you know. Very holy person. It's good, they are all holy. But then some people also appear to be holy where they are not. And so, again, the need to... It's interesting how the... When you want to take a photograph of somebody, then also you have to watch, you know. How everybody just dresses properly, you know. So in the photograph, I want to... So, I, I remember many years ago, we were traveling in Rishikesh and Uttarakashi and places like that, and had a camera and, and there was... Uh, a sadhu, very nice looking one, you know, having all this jata and things. I want to take a picture so that I can show to others, you know, how sadhus are. And so Swami, wait a minute. I was not a Swami that time. He says, tell me, wait a minute. Let me just, you know, get ready. He got ready in every way. He got a few more malas and then everything was done. I took a picture. Unfortunately, what happened is, at the very moment I was clicking my camera, a, a mosquito happened to come and he's, you know, so at that time itself his face, you know, became so... Uh, twitched or ugly, that's unfortunate thing, you know. But anyway, so this, this, this need to become acceptable by to others, the need to be approved by others, the need to be acceptable by others, and therefore need to present myself acceptable as according to the you know, standards that the world has created. Very many false standards. So this is what brings about what we call the the mitvam, the pretentiousness. Some pretending, some cheating is involved in there, or some, little, you know. And also another problem with pretending is, is there because, as I said, I, people have all kinds of restrictions also, and that is also the reason why this kind of things happen. So, Lord Krishna says, Adam Bhitvam, non-pretentiousness. Don't pretend. Meaning that, own up yourself. Own up your limitations. There's, it's not a crime to have limitations. Regardless, as I said, the body is always going to be, have its limitations, the mind is going to have its limitations, your personality is going to have limitations. As long as I equate myself to my personality, I can never become free from the idea that I am limited. Alright? This is what it is. Open up that. That does not mean that I have to go out and declare my limitations before the people. I need not. But at the same time, if the occasion comes, I need not feel ashamed of myself. But Swamiji, what will they think of me? That's another important thing. What will they think of me? They should only think highly of me. So let them think whatever it is. Meaning that, you, so, because otherwise I have to, I have to always keep in my mind what it is I told this fellow, you know. <laughs> what is the salad I told him 6,500 rupees and next time I have to remember. And somebody else asked me, I should, I should remember the same thing, otherwise they will communicate to each other and say, oh, this is what he told me, that's what he told you, and that's how perhaps I'll be exposed anyway. And so, therefore, when I pretend to be something that I am not, again, I must always remember what it is that I'm pretending, what show I'm making before other people. And again, as it is say, how does it help me? Oh, because somebody respects me. But somebody respects me, but as long as I do not respect myself, I can't enjoy that respect. As Swam used to say that this woman goes to the party, there are these wrinkles on the face and she has applied some whatever it is, you know. So, uh, some kind of a skin care has been you know, applied on the skin, which will keep the wrinkles, not, it will, will hide the wrinkles for four hours. <laughs> that is the thing, for four hours. I don't know whether such things are there or not, but this is what it was. After four hours, slowly again, you know, it will appear what it was. And so when you go to the party, sometimes it gets late also and you get concerned, you know, that now, you know, that you keep on looking at her watch and she pulls out this mirror and keeps on looking at herself and see things are still alright. The wrinkles do not show. The wrinkles do not show. But the knowledge that our wrinkles cannot be avoided. 
I can avoid perhaps the sowing of the wrinkles, but I can never avoid the knowledge that I have wrinkles. And never, even if other people take me to a young person, I know very well what I am and it doesn't reach me. So even though I get appreciation of, from people, it does not reach me and therefore I do not benefit from it. And that being the case, it is best to own up what it is. That what is wrong with being old, you know? Nothing wrong in having grey hair, that also is created by God. Nothing wrong in having wrinkles on the face, that also is part of creation. Nothing wrong in being old, that is also part of creation. No, but Swamiji, it is always right to be young. How can everybody be young all the time? You cannot be. The nature is, you know, that is how the nature is. Asti jayate, vardhate, viparinamate, apakshyade, vinasyade idi. And so everything will mature, everything will decline and ultimately perish. That's the nature of things. How can you stop that? And why should you waste your effort and time? You have other things to do. There are better things to do in our life than doing these things and so fighting with the nature. And so accept what it is. I do not know certain things, accept it. You know, don't try to misguide other people by always, you know, when they ask you questions, just you must always pose yourself as a knowledgeable person therefore tell them something or other. Not that. You can say, I do not know. Oh, I will refer to it. Oh, but Swami, that is not right for Swami, you know, that he doesn't know. Well, that's what it is. People expect you to know everything. That's their expectation. I am not obliged to meet everybody's expectations, you know. Because nobody can meet everybody's expectations anyway. The idea is that recognizes realities. That limitation also is a part of reality. As I say, even defect also is a part of reality. Now, if I can do something about it, I do. If I can do something about my limitation, I will do. I have a commitment to grow out of the limitation to the extent that it is possible. But regardless of what I do, I can never become totally free from it. That being the case, I have to learn to gracefully accept my virtues as well as limitations. I should need not be proud about my virtues because they are all given a gift as gift to me. And therefore, with humility I can enjoy them. And I need not really be shameful about my limitations because limitations also are a fact of life. And therefore, without shame, I can accept them. I can own them up. So being humble about my accomplishments and owning up my limitations, this is a healthy way. And so that mind which owns up itself, accepts itself, someday will also be able to accept himself as Atma, as a self. And so, Adam Bhitvam, not only human beings, are, even big institutes also pretend, big countries also pretend, pretend to show something that they have not done. Because, I don't know, that seems to be universal need. Not only human beings, but as I say, institutes do that. Big countries do that. And so, uh, we should recognize that this need arises from ignorance. In reality, I am Satchidananda. In reality, I am a whole and complete being. But Swamiji, that has not yet become a reality for me. Doesn't matter. But that's what Vedanta teaches us. It's reasonable also. It makes sense that I am a complete being. It makes sense that I am Satchidananda. Because I am what I love to be. I love to be a complete being. I love to be a happy being. I love to be a knowledgeable being. I love to be a wise person. I love to be an existing person. I love to be that. And that's why that is my nature. And so Satchit Ananda is my nature. All this body-mind complex is not my nature. It is the personality that is given to me to, to do whatever is required to be done. But by nature, I am Atma, I am Self, I am Brahman. Let me remind myself that I need not be ashamed of myself, that I can own up what I have. I would have a commitment to overcome limitations as I can, but I need not be, I need not reject myself. I need not be ashamed of myself. <coughs> Adam Bhitvam. And also, Dambha, in a traditional sense, is interpreted as Svadharma Prakati Karanam. So, Dharma Dvajitvam. Dharma Dvajitma means that always holding a flag or a staff, you know, that I am such a great Dharmatma, that I am such a religious person, I am such a charitable person. And so people give a check, you know, in donation. But make sure that a photographer is ready. Usually, that's what they used to do. In the public meetings, this man would be invited on the stage to present his donation. He has already arranged himself for a photographer. Because sometimes the organizers may not have taken care of that. And so the person who is making an offering has already organized that a photographer is ready. So when the check is presented, right then the photograph is clicked 
appears next in the newspaper. So this is called Dharma Dvajitvam. It's better that we do what we can do without having the need to make a show about it, you know. So we need not make a show. <coughs> it's difficult. These values are difficult, but we have to slowly learn to practice them. Then alone, this superimpositions will slowly go. You see, all of these arise because of superimpositions of the self upon the non-self. And by deliberately dealing with the values, that superimposition, which is product of ignorance itself, is being dealt with. And so, then ultimately, we can eliminate the ignorance. <coughs> so, Amayatvam, Adam Bhitvam, Ahimsa. Next one. Ahimsanam, Praninam, Apidanam. Kayavang Manubihi, Praninam, Pidanam, Himsa. What is Himsa? Himsa means violence. Ahimsa means non violence. So now, Lord Krishna prescribes the third value, Ahimsa, non violence. <coughs> Kayavang Manubihi, Praninam, Pidanam, Himsa. What is called Himsa? Praninam, Pidanam. To hurt anybody. The himsa is a word, there are root hymns. Hymns in the sense of hurting, killing, injuring, or causing pain, causing suffering. So whenever any action performed by me, at the level of body, at the level of speech, or at the level of mind, causes any kind of pain, or suffering, or hurt, or injury, that action would be called himsa or violence. Any action performed by me, at the level of body, because I perform actions at three levels, at the level of body, at the level of speech, at the level of mind. <coughs> An action performed at any level, if it causes any hurt, either physical hurt or an emotional hurt, any hurt, injury, suffering to any living being, not only to other human beings, but praninam to any living beings. And therefore, the ahimsa or non-violence would involve not only not injuring other human beings, but would involve not injuring any living beings, including the plants and trees and vegetables, including all of them, including all the insects and all the animals, whatever living creatures are there, not injuring, not hurting anybody, not torturing, not causing any kind of pain or suffering to them. <coughs> this is a big thing, ahimsa or non-violence, is a big thing. In fact, it is the most fundamental value. Says Mahabharata, Ahimsa Paramo Dharma. Ahimsa or non-violence is the Parama Dharma, the Supreme Dharma, the most exalted Dharma. Dharma means a righteous action, a righteous way of life. And therefore, practice of Ahimsa or practice of non-violence is the most exalted righteous way of life. To such an extent that Lord Krishna says, not only Lord Krishna, but all the great people say. In India, this ahimsa or non-violence has been prescribed by all great people. Not only Vedas prescribe, Lord Krishna prescribes, of course. But Gautam Buddha also prescribed there, as well as Mahavir, you know, he is the founder of the Jain religion. So, the Jains in particular prescribe this ahimsa. And also Patanjali, sage Patanjali, in the Yoga Shastra also prescribes ahimsa, non-violence. In the Ashtanga Yoga, the yoga of eight steps or eight limbs, the first limb is yama, the second limb is niyama. So yama consists of values, don'ts, what we should not do, the disciplines. Ahimsa, Satya, Asteya, Brahmacharya, Aparigraha. So Yoga Shastra, that may you have these five disciplines. Ahimsa, Satya, truthfulness, meaning non, uh, non-falsehood. Asteya, non-stealing. Brahmacharya, non-indulgence. Aparigraha, non-holding or non-possessing. So these five disciplines of Vrata, these five vows are called Yama, meaning not doing something. So these, in these values, Ahimsa has the first place. And there are five Niyamas. Shaucha, Santosha, Tapaha, Swadhyaya, Ishvara, Pranidhanam. Shaucha means purity. Santosha means contentment. Tapaha means austerity. 
Swadhyaya means study of the scriptures or repeating the name of the Lord and Ishwara Pranidhanam offering all my actions to the Lord or worshipping the Lord. So these five are called Niyama. And so the commentators explain that all these Yama and Niyama really, all of them are for practicing Ahimsa. The primary value is non-violence. And so Satya, Asteya, Aparigraha, Brahmacharya, all of these are forms of Ahimsa or non-violence. And so other Yamas are taught to us by Yoga Shastra in order really to strengthen the Ahimsa and the Niyamas are taught in order to purify that Ahimsa. And therefore, really speaking, one primary value is taught remember the Yoga Shastra and that is Ahimsa or non-violence. And the final Ahimsa. And so the whole yoga, the spiritual pursuit starts with ahimsa, non-violence and culminates in a non-violence. So what's the ultimate non-violence? Purusha, Prakriti, Vivekaha. A discrimination between Purusha and Prakriti. Discrimination between the person and personality, the self and non-self and thus gaining the knowledge of the self is the ultimate in ahimsa. So ahimsa starts as a practice and culminates into the knowledge of the self. And therefore, all the way is Ahimsa. For Vedanta, all the way Viveka. For Yoga Shastra, all the way Ahimsa. They are not different anyway, but this is how, how important this Ahimsa is. And therefore, Mahabharata says, Ahimsa Paramo Dharma. Ahimsa is the most exalted Dharma. <coughs> and we have been saying that all these values are universal values. It is very easy to see how ahimsa or non-violence is indeed a universal value. Because every creature values that. It may be difficult to see how pride, humility, etc. is so universal because in animals, etc. we don't see the need of that. But as far as non-violence is concerned, we find that every living being values that. No living being wants to be hurt. Because that is a life, love for life is something very natural. Love for life and love for happiness. So love for living and love for happy living. I want to live, not only live, but live happily. It's not enough to say I want to live. Because we find some people even wanting to commit suicide and things like that. That means that some people do not want to live. And therefore we should have one qualification. I want to live and live happily. And I know that my neighbor also wants to live and live happily. So this kind of instinctive knowledge has been given to us. Had that not been given to us, then of course I would not feel bad even when I hurt somebody. But then I know that the other person also does not want to get hurt. I want to live and live happily. My neighbor also wants to live and live happily. Further, I do not want that my neighbor should come in my pursuit of life and happiness. I want to be free to live and free to pursue the happiness and I know that my neighbor also wants to live and he does not want me to come in his way of his pursuit of freedom and happiness. So everyone loves to live, everyone loves to be happy, everyone loves to be free and everyone wants to be left alone as far as the freedom is concerned. This is a universal need. Or this is universal nature. And that's why we say that all the values are universal. In particular, ahimsa or non-violence is definitely the universal values. Not only is that among the human beings, but it is there in every living being. I guess even a tree doesn't want to be hurt, doesn't want to be killed. Although we may not be able to see, but when we are there to ask the tree, I guess some kind of reactions would come. Animals do not want to die. Swami, but then animals do not know when they are taken to the slaughterhouse, they do not know that they are going to be killed. But I was told that no, Swamiji, somehow they know. There is a whole line of all these cows or calves or whatever they are, you know, male cows, which are taken to, be, to taken to slaughterhouse, one by one. These fellows who are standing out do not know what is happening behind the wall. And therefore, in the beginning, they just walk along. But as they come closer to the point where they are going to be now entering that place, somehow they know. Somehow they know. And they were instinctively they want to turn away from them. In the beginning not knowing, they were just going towards the place where the slaughtering takes place. 
But as they come closer, somehow they know and they want to turn away. They know that, you know, they are not safe. And naturally, they do not, nobody wants to die. If they have a choice, nobody wants, even mosquito also doesn't want to die. And there for a moment I, I try to slap it, it flies away. If it is smart enough, usually everybody is smart enough also. So God also has given enough smartness in everybody to be able to protect themselves. However weak they may be, but something is always given to them. A deer is, is not as strong, you know, tiger is a very strong animal and will kill the deer, but deer is a much faster animal and I guess more agile and knows how to take care of itself. And this is how the scheme of thing is, that everywhere we see what we call a love for life. And therefore, recognition of this fundamental truth that every creature wants to live. Being sensitive to this, not only every creature wants to live, but nobody loves pain. Nobody loves pain and therefore nobody wants pain. Not only that, everybody loves happiness and therefore everybody loves happiness. Nobody loves pain. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to be hurt. Nobody wants to be injured. So a recognition of this fact and a sensitivity to this need of other creatures and putting that into practice is called ahimsa. Again ahimsa is the perception of life. Non-violence also is only a form of knowledge. And whatever I do is always derived from my perception. Whatever I do always originates from my perception. Therefore, if I have this perception in my mind, if I have that sensitivity in my mind, then whatever I do will be called ahimsa. And so, again, ahimsa or non-violence is not an action. Non-violence also is the perception, the understanding that I have. This is what we call maturity. Each one of the values is maturity. And this maturity of my mind the sensitivity of the mind. So sensitivity 